Romans chapter number 8. And I want us to look at a few verses here. Tonight, Brother Justin told me this morning, he said, Preacher, you're preaching on Brother Willie. said, you're preaching on prayer tonight. I said, yeah. He said, well, I'll just be looking in my Bible if you wonder what I'm doing. And what he meant by that was when you preach on prayer, a lot of times people kind of duck their head because that's an area of our life that we all, that we all uh, need to improve on. But I'm not really preaching tonight about how we ought to pray. I'm preaching about what helps us pray tonight. So you may be well just be able to keep your head up. I doubt you probably need to put your head down for that reason anyway. But Romans chapter 8, let's all stand together tonight. Do me much in prayer for Brother Parkett. He's got to uh, continue to have some things looked at with his arm and his hand. He's talked a little bit about that this morning. Uh, so pray for him as he heals with that. And uh, I, uh, I asked Miss Robin, you know, it was snow this morning. I said, Miss Robin, you doing donuts in the vehicle when you were coming in? And uh, I understand they did not. That's a blessing. Amen. But I did find out a snow fell down on the windshield. Was it Alicia started screaming? Afraid you was going to wreck her too. Amen. And so, but anyway, do be much in prayer for them. I ask the Lord to touch them. Boy, it's been a great day. I appreciate the new families God's added to the church. I appreciate how he's blessed and thank the Lord for that. And I do sense that God wants to revive the church. And we need revival in this day we're living, do we not? I mean, we really need. Boy, we need this. Amen. Uh, we need this in our life. Let's look, if you would. Romans chapter 8. Sometimes I love to just do a little bit of an outline of Romans chapter 7, Romans chapter 8, Romans chapter 9. And I'm actually reading through some of that, and I may do it a little later. There's some great things in here in each chapter, what it's about. But Romans 8, verse 26, the Bible says, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is in the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And of course, I'm going to stop those two verses, but the next verse does tie in, and I'll deal with that maybe in a little later in another sermon. And, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. And that verse fits perfectly with those two verses uh, prior. But tonight, with the help of the Lord, I want to preach on the subject tonight of Holy Ghost praying or tonight the groaning of the Holy Ghost. And I want you to see this tonight, and you'll see some things. You'll have to look at the chapters. I don't have time to cover it all tonight. But you'll find out that in Romans 8, there are three types of groaning. And I'll mention those in just a moment. They're very important in this passage of the Word of God. You can be seated tonight. And let me share some things with you about Holy Ghost praying. I remember several years ago, when I was in a revival experience. Matter of fact, uh, Brother Joe Arthur called me the other day, and Brother Joe was just talking to me about some things in general about what's going on with their church and all they're going through the same as we are uh, with the pandemic, and then uh, about some things about our meeting and so forth. And he and I were talking, and we were talking about a specific time in his ministry and my ministry when uh, we uh, saw a church in its heyday when that church was in the midst of revival. We saw a church with a power of God was so real and so strong that literally friend, literally when you walked in that place you felt the presence of God immediately as you walked in before a song was sung, before anything like that, you just knew God was there and one of the reasons it was like that was because of the groaning of the Spirit of God because of Holy Ghost praying. I remember on several occasions, you've heard me share a couple of them but I remember a group of young people that had gathered together in a room and were praying in this meeting. And boy, how God just set in on those young people and changed their life. One young man walked an hour and a half after that was over around the church, on the, around the auditorium. And all he could ever say with tears running down his face was hallelujah and praise God. He did that for an hour and a half. That young man is a pastor today. He was a teenager then. And God birthed him in that meeting. He's never got over that. His preaching still the same, praying still the same. Friend, listen, we need some things birthed by the Holy Ghost. We need some things that are not made by man, that are not manufactured by man, but that are God, and we know it's God, and we need that in our day. Amen? And let me just say this, our children need to experience that. 
They need to experience that. Well, if you're looking in chapter uh, number 8 of the book of Romans, you'll find there are several things mentioned here about groaning. You'll find there's the groaning of the comforter uh, here in chapter uh, in the book of uh, Romans. You'll also find uh, the Bible refers to the groaning in chapter number uh, 8 of creation. The groaning of creation and uh, how that creation groans. And and then uh, there's the groaning of the Christian or the child of God. And it's all implied here and some written here in Romans chapter number 8. You've got, listen, the Holy Ghost, that groaning in prayer. You have creation groaning because of the curse upon the land. And then you have the groaning of the child of God. When the Bible says that child of God doesn't even know how to pray because the weight is so great upon that child of God as they pray, they cannot even find the words But they pray, and the Bible said with groanings of the Holy Ghost, which cannot be uttered. Let me just say this tonight. Most of us do not know what that's like because we do so many things now in form and formalistic, and and most of the time now we do things, and, and I'm afraid of this, and I hope that's not the case here, and I don't want it to be the case here, but I'm afraid a lot of what goes on in Baptist churches today could go on without the Holy Ghost. I'm afraid that a lot that goes on in churches could go on. Friend, listen, we need services that are spirit-led, power-led, power-driven, uh, where the Holy Spirit of God moves in our midst. And the way to get to that place is Holy Ghost praying. It's Holy Ghost praying. I think tonight, matter of fact, some years ago, a few years ago, uh, before some of our new people were here, I did a message, a series on prayer. And in that series on prayer that we were dealing with, I asked a question one Sunday morning. I said, if all of you would be honest, if all of you would be honest. I'm talking about a church like Calvary Baptist Church. I consider it to be a church I'd join if I wasn't a pastor. I'm talking about a church uh, like this one and people like this. And I asked the question, I said, how many of you would be honest and say that your prayer life leaves a lot to be desired when it comes to serving God? Three quarters of this congregation raised their hand and said, I need help in my prayer life. I need help in my prayer life. Friend, do you realize prayer is our communication with God? Uh, The Bible, God communicates us through His Word, but prayer is that communication. And I'm going to be honest with you, there are times uh, my prayer has to begin with God saying this, God, forgive me of my prayerlessness. And I don't know about you, but I love to get in them times when there's those Holy Ghost praying. Born in the power of God falls. I remember right on the mountain youth camp, Brother uh, Woolage, and I uh, have that little place up on top. They call it that little prayer shack. Boy, I've been in some times in there. I don't know if some of you guys have. Probably Brother James, some of you don't talk about. But I've been in some times in that little prayer shack, praying in all those men of God, Brother Terry Deets, and, and some of those guys. And Boy, they get to praying. Man, you can feel the power of God and the Holy Ghost of God. Uh, man, people were in anguish, and they were praying. But today in our day and hour, I'm afraid we have lost a little bit of that Holy Ghost praying, and we need to get it back. Groaning in the Word of God. The word groaning. The Bible says groanings can't be uttered. Groanings in the Word of God comes from the Greek referring to the anguish of the slaves in Egypt. So when you think about the word groaning in your King James Bible, it's like those slaves in Egypt and they're in those slime pits and they're there and they want to be what God wants them to be and they want to do what God wants them to do and they don't want to be there anymore. So as they're working, they're groaning and they're groaning and they're thinking, God, deliver us. And God, get us out of here. And I'm glad that God sent them a deliverer and I'm glad that God sent us a deliverer in the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm thankful for that tonight. But I want you to notice some things, if you would, in this passage real quick. First of all, tonight, I want you to see the truth about prayer. The truth about prayer. I want you to go back, if you would. And we're going to look at a few verses here and talk a little bit about this. You'll find out here in the Word of God, the Bible lets us know, for we are saved by hope, verse 24. But hope that is seen is not hope for what a man seeth. Why do you hope for? In other words, got to have faith to pray. But if we hope for that we see not, then do we have patience wait for it. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. 
Let me give you a couple of things that are truths about prayer. Number one, when you think about prayer, you think about how helpless we are. How helpless we are. Friend, when you think about prayer, you think about how helpless we are. As I read that verse of you, that verse in itself says there gets to be a time in our life when we are just helpless when it comes to uh, things in our life. We are helpless when it comes to other areas. And the Bible said sometimes we just feel helpless and prayer reminds us that we are helpless. That we cannot do things ourselves. Amen. I don't want a man-made church, do you? I don't want to sing in made church. I love that tonight. That's my kind of stuff. I could sit there and listen to that a long time. That choir full tonight, singing like that. Listen, I can enjoy but I don't want to build a church on that. I don't want to build a church on good singing, though God's blessed us here. We don't want to build a church on a man as a pastor or assistant or who they are. But, friend, if a church is going to be what it ought to be, it's going to have to be a church that relies on God. It says, God, we got to have you, and we need you. Prayer reminds us of the helplessness in us. You ever feel helpless? Listen, I've been pastoring a many year, a lot of years now. And I want to say this tonight, there's a whole lot of things I wish I could fix. There's a whole lot of people's lives I wish I could fix. We were talking today about Miss Pam and how much she loved God. How much she loved God. And we, Wendy and I were talking about that today as we're dealing with that situation a little bit. We're talking about that today. And she and I, as we're talking about it, you do not know how many times during that we had prayed, but we felt helpless. That we just couldn't fix it. How many times in your life have you had a wayward son or daughter or a family member or some uh, trial or hardship and you just felt so helpless and you didn't know what to do? Amen. I was thinking about, I don't know, is Brother Larry outside or is he in here? I was thinking about Brother Larry, and they're probably watching back, but I was thinking about Brother Larry. He was diagnosed with leukemia, and I remember the helplessness you could see because you don't know what to do. I think, Brother Mike, you guys were with, with him, am I correct? And, and I remember Brother Mike calling me, and, and they had told Brother Larry, you don't, get to, you don't get to Baptist Hospital, you won't be here two days from now. And boy, the helplessness you feel, and your heartbreak, and the times in your life you did. Prayer reminds us how helpless we are. It really does. But let me say this, there's another truth about prayer. Not only does it remind us how helpless we are, but it reminds us how helpful He is. Amen. How helpful he is. And you I gotta get this tonight. Bible says in verse 26, for we know not what we should pray for, as we offer the Spirit itself make an intercession for us. Here's that word with groanings. The Bible talks about sending us a comforter. You know about that, a name for the Holy Ghost. And I don't have time to go through that, but you know what I'm talking about. A name for the Holy Ghost. Uh, the word, uh, there's paracletes, P-A-R-A-C-L-E-T-E. -E, and that word for comforter literally means called alongside to help. In other words, when you and I get overwhelmed and we don't know what to do, and we don't know how to turn, and we don't even know how to pray, Sometime we just get by our bed and cry, oh God, oh God. And that's when God will silence us. And that's when God will begin in us to give us hope and begin to work in us and to help us and encourage us. Let me say this to you tonight. We have to learn to pray with the power of the Holy Ghost leading our prayers. And if I were to be honest tonight, most of us are guilty. We're guilty sometimes of not really letting the Holy Ghost take over our prayer life. Sometimes while we're praying about something, we're trying to fix it in our mind while we're praying. But there comes a time when we can't try to fix it. We can't try to change it. All we can do is say, God, I, I'm going to give it to you. Lord, I need some help. Lord, help me. And those times when we're groaning is when God can move in our life and help us when we pray. There's the truth about prayer. How helpless we are. How helpful He is. Do you know I've got up from praying a time or two 
And after I got finished praying, I feel like a hypocrite preaching this because we just don't pray as much as we all. I really don't. Every time I preach on prayer, I feel like a hypocrite. Every time. It's not saying I don't pray, but I just feel like it. I feel like I don't pray like I should. I don't pray as hard as I should, as deep with the Lord as I should. You know, I, I don't have a problem people reading names off a prayer list and praying over things. But I'm afraid sometimes we don't pray with a burden. And the truth about prayer is we have a comforter. I've got up from praying a few times, I was getting ready to say, and when I got up, I really didn't say anything, but I felt better. You ever done that? Got down to pray and really you didn't say anything. You kind of snotted your way through it or you tried to say what you could or, or you tried to pray. But just to be honest, you were about as pitiful as your prayer was. I don't know about you, but I've been there. And then I got up, but I felt better because the Holy Ghost was alongside of me as a comforter, helping me when I couldn't help myself. Thank God He helps us when we can't help ourselves. Thank God He lifts us up when we can't lift ourselves up. Thank God He takes us on when we can't take ourselves on. Thank God for Holy Ghost praying. Amen. First of all, there's the truth about prayer. Secondly, the travail with prayer. Romans 8, 26 once again. The Bible says here in Romans 8, 26 again, Likewise, the Spirit helpeth our infirmity, know not what we should pray for as we offer the Spirit itself, maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. We talked to you a moment about travail. There are times when the words don't seem to come to us. There are times when the Spirit of God is alongside of us. What does the word travail mean? Well, here's what it says in Isaiah 66, verse 8. Who have heard such a thing? Who have seen such things? Shall the earth be made to bring forth in one day? Or shall a nation be born at once? For as soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth her children. The word travail has to do with a painful, laboring effort. A painful, laboring effort. You ladies in this building, about a child, you know what travail is. You have experienced travail. Some of you went through travail with, with long hours involved. You remember what that was like. And I know you remember some of that maybe. But it is amazing. Once the travail is there and the baby is born, it's like all of a sudden that pain's no more. That child is there, and now you have the reward for the travail in your life. The Bible said when Zion travailed. We talk about Zion, Mount Zion. We talk about Jerusalem. We talk about the church. Listen, when's the last time the church uh, literally travailed over anything? Aaron, I believe, is coming. We were speaking this morning. Well, there's underground churches in China that know what it means to travail. There are churches in communist countries that know what it means to travail in prayer. But we have been so spoiled and so blessed as a church in America. Now, we've experienced some things in the last year, but still... We haven't seen the full brunt of what Satan's going to unleash before Jesus comes. I'm telling you, friend, if the Lord tarries, if the Lord tarries, we're going to have to learn to pray in the Holy Ghost. There's travail with prayer. When's the last time it was a painful, a laboring effort for you to pray? We used to call it, and the old timers used to say it like this, praying through, praying through. How many of you can relate to this? Preach, I pray sometimes, fill in my prayers, don't get through the ceiling. Anybody been like that? Right? Have you ever had a time when you was praying, you didn't feel like you could get prayer through the ceiling? And I know that's just a metaphor, but when you feel like you couldn't get you praying through the ceiling, and then all of a sudden, you just broke through? 
You ever had that time when you're praying and all of a sudden, buddy, you're praying it might have seemed like any other time, but you had a bigger burden and a greater burden and all of a sudden, Brother Dermot, it just broke through. And then you didn't want to quit because you got into that holy of holies. You got into that place of praying in travail. Listen, we have preachers preach about revival, preach about your family getting saved, and a lot of times we have people come to the altar and we kneel at the altar. And I know we're time constrained and we're in a building with people. But there's many times I see people come and it's almost like a formality. There's not a brokenness. There's not a brokenness. I remember some years ago, a lady in our church, and it was in the other building. And I remember some years ago, she had a family member. She wanted to get saved. She knew he was dying and going to hell. We were having a meeting. God was really blessing. And I remember, I remember seeing her crawl to the altar, weeping. You could have literally seen the tears that wet the floor, begging God. If I ain't mistaken, it was about a dead mom, but begging God not to let them go. You could hear in the church, God, don't let them go. I remember preaching in Denton, North Carolina. When a woman had prayed her, for her brother for years, the night he got saved, she was still over there wet in the altar, had no idea that he had got saved. She's begging God, travail, travail. When's the last time you got broken over your children, broken over your family, broken over the church, broken over God saving sinners? Travail, travail. Then let me give you this finally tonight. There's the triumph in prayer. The Bible says, And he that searcheth the hearts, knowing what, the mind, what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession with the saints, according to the will of God. Then we get verse 28. That has a lot to do with that triumph. But I want you to see in verse 27, First of all, he knows my heart. He searcheth the hearts. You know how you're going to pray in the Holy Ghost? And I'm not talking about no tongue. I'm not talking about something that needs to be done to bring tension to the flesh. I'm talking about just getting an audience with God. How do you do it? You realize that God knows your heart. We can't fool God when we're praying. What are we going to do? Say, Lord, you know how great a Christian I am. He knows you're not. I, I don't catch myself ever praying like that. I'll be honest, Brother Bill. I don't ever catch myself ever saying, God, well, you know how good I'm doing. Most of the time when I'm praying, I'm always apologizing. Amen. For me or Wendy one, always apologizing. Amen. There's triumph in prayer. What is triumph in prayer? Triumph in prayer is realizing he knows my heart. Watch this also. And he also knows the mind of the Spirit. Not only does he know my heart, he knows the mind of the Spirit of God. When we're praying and the Holy Ghost is moving, the Spirit of God knows the mind set he needs to put us in, that we need to go in, in the direction. He knows my mind. He knoweth the mind. I've often told people the greatest battle in us is not necessarily in our heart as much as it is in our mind. He knows my mind. And then look at the final part. According to the will of God. He knows God's will. Praying in the Holy Ghost means getting your prayers answered. According to the will of God. I have people a lot of times come to me and say, Preacher, we prayed about it. Do you realize Holy Ghost praying will never lead you away from God? And it will never lead you contrary to the Word of God. Amen? You can say it's the will of God all you want to, but if Scripture doesn't back it, if Scripture doesn't back it, well, I believe God's called us to do this, preacher, not if Scripture doesn't back it. No, sir. Because if Scripture doesn't back it, it is not what you think it is. We have to be a Holy Ghost led in what we do. There's some things in my life I'm 100% sure of. I'm 100% sure of what I'm saying. I'm 100% sure. 
I know I'm saved. Amen. Number two, I am 100% sure God called me to preach. Well, I'm sure of it. You know why? Because it was spirit led. I remember the tugging of the Holy Ghost. Brother Aaron, you wouldn't have your family in Maryland, Washington, D.C. if the Holy Ghost hadn't tugged on you. I hope you're smart enough. Amen. Brother Matt, they'll do our mission conference later in the year in Papua New Guinea. All these years he's been there. You can sense the tugging of the Holy Ghost as God put him in the jungles for a long time. People see now say, well, he's in the city there now. Well, it, it, it still ain't New York City. You want, well, of course, it's probably better than New York City. Hey, Amen. I know this may be recorded, but that dude's a claim. You can quote me. I want you to understand God lets us know His will through travailing prayer. I remember when God, over 18 years ago now, spoke to my heart about coming to Calvary. I was in a prophet's room in Lexington, North Carolina, to Bethany Baptist Church. Brother Roy had spoken to me a couple times. I really felt like I wanted to stay on the road. Some of y'all been here a long time know that I was enjoying evangelism. It was, it was, it has, it had its, you know, great and good times about like anything. But I remember that morning when God woke me up and spoke to my heart and said, "You got to go there. You, you've got to, you've got to go there." I'll never forget it. It was travail. It wasn't just a fall or a win, but it was God. And I remember saying to God, "I'll do." what you want me to do, but would you please tell me now? And I'll never forget what she said to me because we'd been, Lord, I'd been in one church 14 years. Most of that church had been led to Christ. We left there. Daniel wanted to divorce me. And, and I remember when we went up to Peace Haven in nine months, God allowed us to be used to reach young people. And, and we had a youth group with over 200 teenagers in it. And I remember when God shut that down, that was just a stepping stone for me, put me in evangelism, and here goes Wendy again. We done been sold our home in Burlington. Now we done gone in a house up in Boonville, close to the Yakima. Now we're out of it, and now we're going to South Carolina, built a, got bought another new home that we thought we could never have in our entire life. And then I have to walk home or go home and say, Wendy, we're going to Statesville. We didn't even know what we didn't know it was the crossroads of America. We had no clue God was sending us to the crossroads of America, Arundel County. I'll never forget the only thing she said to me. My wife, I believe, would follow me wherever God told me to go. But I remember this time, she said these words: "It better be." I said, baby, you know I wouldn't do it. She said, it better be God. Well, it was. Thank you for the few that still amen me 18 years later. Others of you, you done gave up. But listen, can I tell you this? That stuff comes through a whole lot of prayer. A whole lot of prayer. Let's be honest again tonight. And I don't want to sound like we're all just horrible Christians with the saying this, but if we probably spent more time on social media talking about the problem than we've spoke to God, I mean, I've been guilty of that. Maybe we should spend more time talking to the Lord. Don't, don't put somebody in a box and don't, <laughs> don't get mad at me here. But when you type a prayer on Facebook, God's probably not reading Facebook. You know what I'm saying? Now, I understand why people do that. I mean, they want the person to know the thing about them. But God's not saying, hold up, angel, stop me. I got something, something's on Facebook. You know what I'm saying? Don't get mad at me. I, I know why you do it. I know why we do it. I'm not, that's, I'm not being critical. You, you're doing that to encourage whoever's going through that. I understand that. I've had people pray for me on it. 
they, didn't, they didn't spell my name right or they missed my name. And I was just like, well, I hope God knows that when he reads it. You know what I'm saying? But here's the thing. You don't have to have that. You can sit in your car, in your house, because it's access. Throne room access. The word boldness in the Word of God means confidently. We can approach the throne of grace boldly, confidently. Amen. I want us to experience revival at this church. I think coming through what we've been through, we need revival. I don't know about you, but I need it. I just want a good old-fashioned, you know, just a heartbreaking soul win. I'm talking about just revival. You go out the door, so I can't wait to get back tomorrow night. We need that. Do y'all realize we've almost been in a mess? I'll be preaching in Florida next month in a Jubilee. That was the meeting when COVID started. Girls, when I was leaving in March preaching in Florida, they were closing Disney. And I told Wendy, I said, this is big. Because they're closing Disney. Something's big. And here we are now, a year later. 400 plus thousand Americans, if numbers are correct, I don't know. I don't believe nobody no more. But I'll tell you this, there's a lot of people dying. And some of them are dear to me. We just need revival. We need God to stir us. We need God to get the sin out of our heart, the bitterness out of our heart, the malice toward other people out of our heart. We need to forgive. We need to move on. We need to serve God. We need to live for God. We need to learn to pray in the Holy Ghost. Amen. You stand to your feet tonight. Thank you for being so attentive. You don't have to raise your hand with this tonight, but let me ask you a question. How many of you this evening in this auditorium, don't raise your hand, but admit one of the things that Satan fights you the hardest with is prayer. Then you would think it'd be easy, wouldn't it? Because we, we all talk. You would think that just pray, what's hard about praying? Why does Satan fight prayer so? Satan fights prayer because it is that communication with us and God. And Satan knows we can't pray if we're not right with God. With God, I'm talking about. It's hard to pray when you're not right with God. Amen. If you tonight would say, Pastor, I want to pray like a sinner. And I'm not talking about 20 minutes instead of 10. I'm talking more about quality time than the quantity of time. I'm talking about when you really want to reach heaven. I'm talking about when you really see that loved one going to hell. When you really see the condition of the church or the country. When you really see the condition of your own life and it ain't a matter of the quantity of your prayer. But it's the quality. It's when the Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost, helps you pray. Some of you got big decisions in your life still to make. Don't make them with a flippant attitude. Seek God in prayer. Ask God to help you. Brother James, you're going to sing that little song for us tonight. Love that song. While he sings this tonight, I wonder if anybody's got something they want to pray about tonight. Maybe just something. I know Miss Wendy's praying for this little girl, 20-some years old, battling COVID. Maybe just something on your heart tonight that means more to you than just, than just a few words, but it really means something to you. I mean, it's something that you'd want to pray in the Holy Ghost. It's something that you'd want God to intervene. It, it's something you'd want God to move in. It's something that rips at your very, very heart, your very soul. It's something that tears at you. It's something tonight that just grabs at you. God teaches to pray and travail. 
Teach us to travail 